to everyone. Welcome to a new study on the Gospel of Luke. Welcome in a new day. For some already started, some already are in the evening. What a world, right? Welcome to the one who is just pushing the button for the first time. Welcome to this in-depth study. And today we're going to have our study of chapter 7 in the Gospel of Luke. Compassion in action. This is your Pastor Yeti. Compassion has been defined as your pain in my heart. What pain our Lord must have felt as he ministered from place to place. In this chapter alone, Jesus is confronted with the miseries of a dying servant, a grieving widow, a perplexed prophet, and a repentant sinner. And he helped them all. If a hardship committee had been asked to decide which of these persons was deserving, we wonder who would have been chosen. Jesus helped them all because compassion does not measure, it ministers. Justice seeks out only the merits of the case, but pity only regards the need. It was compassion, not just justice, that motivated the great physician who came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Luke 5.32 Let's meet these four hurting people and see our Lord's responses to their needs. First, the servant, his response to fate, 7, 1 to 10. In the Gospels and the Book of Acts, Roman centurions are presented as quality men of character. And this one is a sterling example. The Jewish elders had little love for the Romans in general, and Roman soldiers in particular, and yet the elders commended this officer to Jesus. He loved the Jewish people in Capernaum and even built them a synagogue. He loved his servant and did not want him to die. This centurion was not a stoic who insulted himself from the pain of others. He had a heart of concern even for his lowly servant boy who was dying from a paralyzing disease. Matthew 8, verse 6. Matthew's condensense report, Matthew 8, 5 to 13, does not contradict Luke's fuller account. The centurion's friend represented him to Jesus and then represented Jesus to him. When a newscaster reports that the president or the prime minister said something to Congress or Parliament, this does not necessarily mean that the message was delivered by them in person. It was probably delivered by one of their official representatives, but the message would be received as from the president or prime minister personally. We are impressed not only with this man's great love, but also his great humility. Imagine a Roman officer telling a poor Jewish rabbi that he was unworthy to have him under his house. The Romans were not known for displaying humility, especially before their Jewish subjects. But the characteristic that most impressed Jesus was the man's fate. Twice in the Gospel record, 
we are told that Jesus marveled. Here in Capernaum, he marveled at the faith of Gentile, and in Nazareth, he marveled at the unbelief of the Jews. Mark 6, verse 6. The only other person Jesus commended for having great faith was a Gentile woman whose daughter he delivered from a demon. Matthew 15, 28. It is worthy, it is worth nothing that in both of these instances, Jesus healed at a distance. And see Psalm 107, 20 and Ephesians 2, 11 to 13. The centurion's faith certainly was remarkable. After all, he was a Gentile whose background was pagan. He was a Roman soldier, trained to be self-sufficient, and we have no evidence that he had ever heard Jesus preach. Perhaps he heard about Jesus' healing power from the nobleman whose son Jesus had healed. Also at a distance. His soldiers may also have brought him reports of the miracles Jesus had performed, for the Romans kept close touch with the events in Jewish life. The import words in Luke 7-8 is also Let me give you another verse for that too. You can find it also in Matthew 8 verse 9. It also should be in Matthew indeed 8 verse 9 as well, but in the King James Version omits it for some reason. The other and ASB is an altered translation of the Bible, as also in both places. The officer saw a parallel between the way he commanded his soldiers and the way Jesus commanded diseases. Both the centurion and Jesus were under authority, and because they were under authority, they had the right to exercise authority. All they had to do was say the word, and things happened. What tremendous faith this man exhibited. No wonder Jesus marveled. If this Roman, with very little spiritual instruction, had that kind of faith in God's word, how much greater our faith ought to be. We have an entire Bible to read and study, as well as nearly 2,000 years of church history to encourage us. And yet, we are guilty of no faith, or light faith. Our prayer ought to be, Lord, increase our faith. The second, the widow. Jesus responds to despair, 7, 11, 17. Nain was about 25 miles from Capernaum, a good day's journey away. Yet Jesus went there even though he was not requested to come. Since the Jews buried their dead the same day, Deuteronomy 21, 23, and Acts 5, 5 to 10, it is likely that Jesus and the disciples arrived at the city gate late in the afternoon of the day the boy died. Four special meetings took place at the city gate that day. One, two crowds met. We can only marvel at the providence of God when we see Jesus meet that funeral procession just as it was heading for the burial ground. He lived on a divine timetable as he obeyed the will of his father. The sympathetic Savior always gives help when we need it most. What a contrast between the crowd that was following Jesus and the crowd following the widow and her dead son. Jesus and the disciples were rejoicing in the blessing of the Lord, but the widow and her friends were lamenting the death of her only son.
Jesus was heading for the city while the mourners were heading for the cemetery. Spiritually speaking, each of us is in one of these two crowds. If you have trusted Christ, you are going to the city. Hebrew 11 verse 10, 13 to 16, 12, 22. If you are dead in sin, you are already in the cemetery and under the condemnation of God. John 3, 36, Ephesians 2, 1, 2, 3. You need to trust Jesus Christ and be raised from the dead. John 5, 24, Ephesians 2, 4 to 10. Second, two only sons met. One was alive but destined to die. The other dead but destined to live. The term only begotten as applied to Jesus means unique, the only one of its kind. Jesus is not a son in the same sense that I am. If you say if about your own son or whatever male it's supposed to be reflected on. Having been brought into existence by conception and birth, since Jesus is eternal God, he has always existed. The little Son of God declares Christ's divine nature and his relationship to the Father, to whom the Son has willingly subjected himself from all eternity. All the persons of the Godhead are equal, but in the economy of the Trinity, each has a specific place to fill and task to fulfill. 3. Two sufferers met. Jesus, the man of sorrows, could easily identify with the widow's heartache. Not only was she in sorrow, but she was now left alone in a society that did not have resources to care for a widow. What would happen to her? Jesus felt the pain that sin and death have brought into his world, and he did something about it. 4. Two enemies met. Jesus faced death, the last enemy, 1 Corinthians 15, 26. When you consider the pain and grief that it causes in this world, death is indeed an enemy, and only Jesus Christ can give us victory. Jesus has only to speak the word, and the boy was raised to life and held. The boy gave two evidences of life. He sat up and he spoke. He was lying on an open stretcher, not in a closed coven, so it was easy for him to sit up. We are not told that he said what he said, but it must have been interesting. What an act of tenderness it was for Jesus to take the boy and give him to his rejoicing mother. The whole scene reminds us of what will happen when the Lord returns and we are reunited with our loved ones who have gone to glory. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. The responses of the people was to glorify God and identify Jesus with the prophet the Jews had been waiting for. It did not long for the report of his miracle to spread. People were even more enthusiastic to see Jesus, and great crowds followed him. 3. John the Baptist is response to doubt. Chapter 7, 18-35 Confusion John had been in prison some months. But he knew what Jesus was doing because his own disciples kept him informed. It must have been difficult for this man, accustomed to a wilderness life, to be confined in a prison. The physical and emotional strain were no doubt great, and the long days of waiting did not make it easier. The Jewish leaders did not, nothing to intercede for John, and it seemed that even Jesus was doing nothing for him. If he came to set the prisoners free, then John the Baptist was a candidate. 
It is not unusual for great spiritual leaders to have their days of doubt and uncertainty. Moses was ready to quit on one occasion, number 11, 10 to 15. And so were Elijah, 1 King 19, and Jeremiah 20, 7 verse 9, 14 to 18. And even Paul knew the meaning of despair, 2 Corinthians 1, 8, 9. There is a difference between doubt and unbelief. Doubt is a matter of the mind. We cannot understand what God is doing or why he is doing it. Unbelief is a matter of the will. We refuse to believe God's word and obey what he tells us to do. Doubt is not always a sign that a man is wrong. It may be a sign that he is thinking. In John's case, his inquiry was not born of willful unbelief, but of doubt nourished by physical and emotional strain. You and I can look back at the ministry of Christ and understand what he was doing, but John did not have that advantage. John had announced judgment, but Jesus was doing deeds of love and mercy. John had promised that the kingdom was at hand, but there was no evidence of so far. He had presented Jesus as the Lamb of God, so John must have understood something about Jesus' sacrifice. Yet how did this sacrifice relate to the promised kingdom for Israel? He was perplexed about God's plan and his place in it. But let's not judge him harshly. For even the prophets were perplexed about some of these things. 1 Peter 1, 10-12 Confirmation, verses 21-23 Jesus did not give the two men a lecture on theology or prophecy. Instead, he invited them to watch as he healed many people of many different afflictions. And certainly, these were his credentials as the promised Messiah, Isaiah 29, 18-19, chapter 35, 4-6, and chapter 42, 1-7. He had not established a political kingdom, but the kingdom of God was there in power. The Greek word translated offended gives us our English word scandalize, and it referred originally to the bait stick and a trap. John was in danger of being trapped because of his concern about what Jesus was not doing. He was stumbling over his Lord and his ministry. Jesus gently told him to have faith, for his Lord knew what he was doing. There are many people today who criticize the church for not changing the world and solving the economic, political, and social problems of society. What they forget is that God changes his world by changing individual people. History shows that the church has often led the way in humanitarian service and reform, but the church's main job is to bring lost sinners to the Savior. Everything else is a byproduct of that. Proclaiming the gospel must always be the church first priority. Commendation. Commendation. 24 to 30. What we think of ourselves or what others think of us is not as important as what God thinks. Jesus waited until the messengers had departed, and then he publicly commended John for his ministry. At the same time, he exposed the sinful hearts of those who rejected John's ministry. John the Baptist was not a compromiser, a reed blowing in the wind, nor was he a popular celebrity, enjoying the friendship of great people and the pleasures of wealth. 
John did not waver or weaken, no matter what people did to him. John was not only a prophet, but he was a prophet whose ministry was prophesied. See Isaiah 40 verse 3 and Malachi 3 verse 1. The last of the Old Testament prophets, John had the great privilege as God's messenger of introducing the Messiah to Israel. How is the least person in the kingdom of God greater than John? In position, not in character or ministry, John was a herald of the king, announcing the kingdom, and believers today are children of the kingdom and the friends of the king. John's ministry was a turning point in both the nation's history and in God's plan of redemption. Luke seven twenty nine to 30 are the words of Jesus, not an explanation from Luke. They answer the question some of the people were asking. If John is such a great prophet, why is he in prison? The answer is because of the willful unbelief of the religious leaders. The common people accepted John's message and were baptized by him as proof of their repentance. They justified God, which means they agreed with what God said about them. But the religious leaders justified themselves, not God, and rejected John and his message. Condemnation 31-35 to Jesus compared that generation to people who were childless, not childlike, and nothing pleased them. He probably referring to the scribes and Pharisees in particular. John was an individual who declared a stern message of justice, of judgment, and they said, he has a demon. And Jesus mingled with the people and preached a gracious message of salvation, and they said, he's a glutton and wine-biber, a wine-biber, and a friend of publicans and sinners. They wanted neither the funeral nor the wedding. Because nothing pleased them. People who want to avoid the truth about themselves can always find something in the preacher to criticize. This is one, this is one way they justify themselves. But God's wisdom is not frustrated by the arguments of the wise and prudent. It is demonstrated in the change of lives of those who believe. This is how true wisdom is justified. 4. A sinful woman, his response to love. Luke 7, 36-50 Jesus not only accepted hospitality from the publicans and sinners, but also from the Pharisees. They needed the word of God too, whether they realized it or not. We trust that Simon's invitation was a sincere one, and that he did not have some ulterior motive for having Jesus in his home. If he did, his plan backfired because he ended up learning more about himself than he cared to know. The Repentant Woman, 36-38 to It was customary in that day for outsiders to hover around during banquets so they could watch the important people and hear the conversation. Since everything was open, they could even enter the banquet hall and speak to a guest. This explains how this woman had access to Jesus. He was not behind locked doors. In that day, women were not invited to banquets. Jewish rabbis did not speak to women in public, 
nor did they eat with them in public. A woman of this type would not be welcomed in the house of Simon the Pharisees. The critical host, 39 to 46. Simon was embarrassed both for himself and for his guests. People had been saying that Jesus was a great prophet, but he certainly was not exhibiting much prophetic discernment if he allowed a sinful woman to anoint his feet. He must be fraud. Simon's real problem was blindness. He could not see himself the woman or the Lord Jesus. It was easy for him to say, she is a sinner, but impossible for him to say, I am also a sinner. Jesus proved that he was indeed a prophet by reading Simon's thoughts and revealing his needs. The parable does not deal with the amount of sin in the person's life, but the awareness of that sin in his heart. How much sin must a person commit to be a sinner? Simon and the woman were both sinners. Simon was guilty of sins of the spirit, especially pride, while the woman was guilty of something else. Her sins were known, while Simon's sins were hidden to everyone except God. And both of them were bankrupt and could not pay their debt to God. Simon was just as spiritual bankrupt as the woman, only he did not realize it. Forgiveness is a gift of God's grace, but that was paid in full by Jesus Christ. The word frankly means graciously and freely. The woman accepted God's free offer of salvation and expressed her love openly, and Simon rejected that offer and remained unforgiven. He was not only blind to himself, but he was blind to the woman and to his honored guest. The Forgiving Savior, 44 and 50. The woman was guilty of sins of commissions, but Simon was guilty of sin of omission. He had not been a gracious host to the Lord Jesus. There are two errors we must avoid as we interpret our Lord's words. First, we must not conclude that this woman was saved by her tears and her gift. Jesus made it clear that it was her faith alone that saved her, for no amount of good works can pay for salvation. Nor should we think that lost sinners are saved by love, either God's love for them or their love for God. God loves the whole world. Yet the world, the whole world is not saved. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Grace is love that pays a price, and that price was the death of the Son of God on the cross. Jesus did not reject either the woman's tears or a gift of ointment because her works were the evidence of her faith. Faith without works is death. We are not saved by faith plus works. We are saved by faith that leads to works. This anonymous woman illustrated the truth of Galatians 5, 6. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. How did the woman know that her sins were forgiven? Jesus told her. How do we know today that we have been forgiven? God tells us so in his word. Here are just a few verses to consider. 
Isaiah 1:18, chapter 43, 25 to 26, chapter 55, 6 to 7, Acts 13, 38 to 39, Romans 4, 7 to 8, and Ephesians 4, 32, and Hebrews 8, verse 12. Once you understand the meaning of God's grace, you have no trouble receiving His free and full forgiveness and rejoicing in it. Of course, the legalistic critics at the dinner were shocked when Jesus said, For sins which are many are forgiven. By saying this, Jesus was claiming to be God. But He is God, and He died for the sins that she committed. His words of forgiveness were not cheap words. They cost him dearly on the cross. How was this woman saved? She repented of her sins and put her faith in Jesus Christ. How did she know she was truly forgiven? She had the assurance of his word. What was the proof of her salvation? Her love for Christ expressed in sacrificial devotion to him. For the first time in her life, she had peace with God. Literally, it reads, go into peace, for she had moved out of the sphere of enmity toward God and was now enjoying peace with God. When Jesus healed the centurion's servant, it was a great miracle. An even greater miracle was is raising the widow's son from the dead. But in this chapter, the greatest miracle of all was saving this woman from her sins and making her a new person. The miracle of salvation has to be the greatest miracle of all, for it meets the greatest need, brings the greatest results, and they last forever, and cost the greatest price. Simon was blind to the woman, and blind to himself. He saw her past. Jesus saw her future. I wonder how many reject sinners have found salvation through the testimony of this woman in Luke's Gospel. She encouraged us to believe that Jesus can take any sinner and make him or her into a child of God. But God's forgiveness is not automatic. We can reject His grace if we will. In 1830, a man named George Wilson was arrested for mail theft, the penalty for which was hanging. After a time, President Andrew Jackson gave Wilson a pardon, but he refused to accept it. The authorities were puzzled. George, should Wilson be freed or hanged? They consulted Chief Justice John Marshall, who handled down this decision. A pardon is a slip of paper, the value of which is determined by the acceptance of the person to be pardoned. If it is refused, it is no pardon. George Wilson must be hanged. If you have never accepted God's pardon, now is the time to believe and be saved. Let me give you some questions. Who are some of the hurting people in your life? What was so impressive about the Roman centurion in chapter 7, verse 1 to 10? What did Jesus marvel at? What was the outcome? What have you seen the divine timetable at work in your life. When have you seen? How did the crowd respond to the miracle of raising up the widow's dead son? How do you think you would respond if you saw a miracle like that? What does the story of John the Baptist teach us about how doubt and unbelief are different?
from the way Jesus dealt with the needs of the centurion, the widow, and John the Baptist, and the sinful woman. What guidelines or actions, however simple, can we find to use as we seek to follow in his steps? Now, my dear ones, this is the end of our very well in-depth study of Luke 7. May God guide you and let him help you to find and search in your heart. Reflect on your thoughts. This chapter is very personal. As I think the word of God is always personal, spreads out to the world as we do our mission to touch others and bring them to salvation. Of course, this is always a matter of the heart. I believe as if the person never can really experience that love, that unconditional love in the heart that changes everything eternal. I think there is a problem to receive also the grace of God. As long as they don't understand that person is not able to change. And that is why it is so important that you and me are there to be there. In every question they have, in everything that you see, it's going the wrong way. To help them to bring their life under the salvation of Jesus Christ. May God bless you and protect you. May he keep you from all harm. God's blessings and have a great day. Bye.